Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Memory Lab Network's April 2021 webinar. And we're very lucky today to have Paul Kelly with us from DC Public Library's People's Archive. Paul is the Digital Initiatives Coordinator there, and he's going to be talking about web archiving today. So, Paul, please take it away. Okay. Um... Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Paul Kelly, Digital Initiatives Coordinator for DC Public Library, uh, People's Archive Department in Washington, DC. Thanks for the, uh, for the intro, Siobhan. Um, so yeah, like Siobhan said, I'm here today to talk to all of you about web archiving, um, what it is, why it's important, uh, different ways of doing it. Um, and kind of to talk a little bit about how we've implemented it at DC Public Library. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you all giving me the, the space to talk. Um, so thanks a lot and welcome to all of you. Um, so yeah, before I dive into, you know, what I'm actually here to talk about, it's, it probably makes sense for me to give you a little bit of background about where I work, even though I'm now realizing that Siobhan also works where I work, so you might already know this, but bear with me. Um, so yeah, I work for the People's Archive at DC Public Library. Um, People's Archive is DC Library's uh, local history center. Um, it's been collecting materials that document the social, cultural, and political life of DC since 1905. Um, and all those materials are grouped together in what used to be known as special collections, now known as the People's Archive. Um, we have like sort of three major collections, I guess. Uh, the first one is called Washingtoniana, which documents the history and the culture of DC as a whole. Um, this is the collection, the original collection that started in 1905. Um, it includes printed materials like pamphlets, posters, city ordinances, it has maps and atlases, telephone directory, directories, business records, newspapers, zines, photographs, oral histories, uh, audiovisual stuff, uh, born digital stuff like web archives, and so on and so forth. Um, if you ever heard of, you know, the, for example, the DC Punk Archive Project, that's part of this collection. Um, exciting stuff. Um, and then there's another collection called the, uh, the Peabody Collection, which documents exclusively the Georgetown neighborhood of the city. Um, and then in 1972, we began a Black Studies collection. Um, so it mainly consists of material related to the African-American experience with a, uh, an emphasis on civil rights and social justice within DC specifically. Um, and kind of different to the, the other collections that we have, um, that is mainly a book collection. Um, last two on this slide here, Dig DC, those are our digital collections. And then the final thing here is the People's Web Archive, which is our web archive collections. I will click this link so it is open for later. Um, but we can move on after the probably slightly too long preamble so so why would someone want to archive the web um before i dive into this i am going to kind of assume that you folks have just like never heard of web archiving i just find this a pretty easy way to kind of kick things off i i make no presumptions about people's knowledge levels um and you know you may know more than me, you may know less than me, but we'll, uh, we'll still start from, start from here. So why would you wanna archive the web at all? And what, what even does that mean? So how many times has this happened to you? You've, um, <clears throat> you've bookmarked or emailed a link to yourself for a page to look at sometime in the future. Um, in this uh, screenshot here, I bookmarked a page I think from like 10 years ago when I was going to visit, uh, I was going to visit Scotland and I was going to do a self-guided driving tour of filming's, of filming locations from the Wicker Man. So um, I got interested like a couple months ago 
I'm like looking at that link again, but I clicked on it and it was gone. So you had this link for years, you click on it and you get an error message instead of a working website. So you could have been cutting and pasting this link for years or clicking that same bookmark for years without any issues at all. And suddenly it just doesn't work. Um, I think this is a pretty universal experience, happens to everybody. Um, and it's kind of natural to think that it's just one of those things that happens and there's not really anything that can be done about it. Um, but enter the internet archive. Um, so if you or someone else had created a web archive of the page that you could suddenly no longer reach, then you'd still be able to view the version that had been saved. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So lo and behold, I went to the Internet Archive. I entered the URL in this uh, address bar here. And there it was, captured in February, uh, on February 4th, 2005 at 11.49 AM. And there is the site. Pretty nifty. Um, but what about pages that haven't necessarily disappeared? What about pages that have changed? Um, why might being able to document that change be important? Um, well, here's one recent example. Um, and by recent, I mean in the past, uh, it's, it's actually a year old, but recent enough. Um, so this is something that the, the group documenting the, documenting the now uh, highlighted around a year ago. Um, so I'll just read the tweet actually. So <clears throat> Daniel Dale says, after Jared Kushner's comment about how the strategic national stockpile is not supposed to be for estates, lots of people pointed to the fact that its own website says it is. The language on the website has now been changed. So you can see the before, uh, a lot more text there, a lot more descriptive. I'm not going to read all of it. And after, uh, dramatically cut back. Um, so, I mean, without really diving into the politics of this, um, you can definitely kind of see how there's something fishy about this, right? Um, and how one possible use of web archives might be in holding government or indeed anyone to some kind of account. Um, so, I mean, in this example, a government website clearly stated a policy. A politician publicly contradicted that policy. And then 24 hours later, the website had been changed to reflect what the politician had said. Um, not cool. <laughs> um, and seeing those, uh, those, those two versions side by side um, kind of not only helps us be safe in the knowledge that we're not misremembering something, um, but it shows how web archiving can be a, a very important um, archival and documentary activity. Um, all right, so let's say this all looks great. Um, I understand why web archiving is useful. Um, I kind of want to start thinking about how to use it at either like in my personal life or at my institution. How do I get started? Um, what services or technologies are out there for me to use? So I've already showed you an example of something in the, in the Wayback Machine, although I don't think I named it as the Wayback Machine, but yeah, we just looked at the Wayback Machine. Um, so the Wayback Machine is a digital archive of the World Wide Web. Um, and this is just language straight from, from their site that I'm using right now. So, you know, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna toot their own horn a little bit. So don't blame me. Um, so Wayback Machine is a digital archive of the World Wide Web founded by the Internet Archive, a nonprofit library based in San Francisco. It allows the user to go, quote, back in time and see what websites looked like in the past. It was developed with the intention of providing, quote, universal access to all knowledge by preserving archived copies of defunct web pages. So the Wayback Machine is the Internet Archive's flagship service. Um, it has been archiving websites since 1996. So you can, you can plug a URL in there and look at websites from 1996. And actually a, a very kind of fun way to to do that is um, 
I kind of like to sometimes plug in the the web address of like a musician's website or a band's website from back then that's still active today to see how dramatically <laughs> they have changed. Um, it can be pretty fun. Um, so the the way that this uh, this service works is there there isn't really a ton of human <clears throat> human selection that goes into what is in the Wayback Machine. It utilizes what is called a crawler that kind of is a program that explores websites and hops from link to link uh, without any human intervention, just saving content as it goes. So it will like, you know, go go to the, it'll go to like a, a drop down menu on, on some site, click every single link, go to those links, grab the content and keep going and keep going until um, either there's some sort of a time limit that is met or it just has nowhere else to go. Um, but if you want to add content to the Wayback Machine, they also offer a couple of uh, services. They have this service here called Save Page Now, which, you know, let's say you are writing a research paper and you're citing, a, you, you want to cite something that's on the internet, but you're kind of concerned that that source might disappear or change. Um, a great idea is just to kind of create a snapshot of it right here. Uh, you know, how it looked when you were citing it. So you're kind of left with something that is supposedly going to be persistent for, for the life of, of your document. So that's a way you can get them to save a page at your behest. Um, and another service that they offer is this, uh, this browser extension. So this is the Chrome Web Store, but I think it's also available for Firefox. Uh, what this extension does is, um, when you have it running and you encounter one of those 404 errors, like uh, like this one here, we're having trouble finding that site. When that happens, it will automatically redirect you to an archived version of the page. I think the most recent archived version of the page. So <clears throat> it is a pretty nifty tool to kind of um, not really have those holes in your internet browsing. But you know this isn't necessarily like scalable, right? I mean, it's it's free, which is great. But if you're wanting to build a web archiving program at your institution, this is like probably not the way to do it. Ah, oh, sip of water. Um, lucky for all of us, <clears throat> the Internet Archive will let us pay them money to give us access to this technology to kind of create. You know, to, to add a little bit more of a <clears throat> human intent and some some real curation on top of the the Wayback technology. So I'm talking about a service called Archivit, and this is what DCPL uses to build its web archive collections. Um, it's a subscription service. Um, obviously, by Internet Archive, it enables you to take all the technology of the Wayback Machine and use it to capture, manage, or search collections of digital content. Uh, that was born on the web without any technical expertise or hosting facilities. Um, so yeah, it allows users to create targeted thematic web archive collections like DCPLs. It's very simple to use. Um, it kind of creates a centralized corpus of web archive data. And what I, what I mean by that is that anything that is crawled by your institution um, while it is viewable through a, a portal that's unique to say your library or your archive, it's actually added to the, the Wayback Machine as a whole. So the work that you do as a web archivist kind of benefits the internet at large. Like this is available to everybody once you uh, once you create that content. Um, and this is what it looks like. If I can get this thing to disappear. There we go. <laughs> So these are DC libraries collections. And you can see, you can add things, like you can add pretty detailed metadata, like subject headings, uh, dates, resource types, formats, language, location data, unique identifiers. Um, 
and our collections are kind of built around themes. Uh, this top one, ANCs of Washington, DC, that's like a local government collection. We have a collection about comic books, like web comics that are about, about Washington, DC. We have our obligatory COVID-19 in Washington, DC. We have neighborhood blogs. So, I mean, you can kind of get a, an idea of the kinds of content that are here. Uh, so not only is there a kind of collection level metadata, there's page level metadata. So you can see descriptions here and subjects and creator and all that fun stuff. And when you click through this initial sort of metadata rich interface, you just end up back sort of in the, the same way back machine land as we uh, <clears throat> demonstrated on that, that earlier slide with that Wicker Man self-guided tour. Um, something about these uh, sites is they often take a while to load, so I'm not going to wait around for, for that. But trust me, it, it, it will it'll load. <laughs> um, but yeah, it isn't free, which is honestly like a pretty insurmountable barrier for a lot of institutions. Um, I am sensitive to that, so we're going to talk about some other options here um, in the next couple of slides. So web recorder. So let me talk a little bit about Web Recorder. So the Web Recorder project team builds tools specializing in a sort of more user-driven form of web archiving, where the user is able to direct the archiving process through their browser, through like the actions that they take while browsing. Um, and that is kind of different to how the crawler works for Internet Archive. Remember, I sort of mentioned that uh, the crawler for those guys just sort of uh, does its own thing, follows link, like is, follows its own methodology, just link hopping. Um, this will save the content that you view specifically in your, in your own browser. Um, so it supports the creation of, instead of like a centralized corpus of web archive data, this is more a kind of decentralized model. Um, so instead of like that central repository, um, we're talking more like decentralized archives by individuals and institutions. Um, and I, I guess like a key goal of doing it that way is to support web archives in a variety of environment and storage scenarios. Um, you know, you could store your web archives from Web Recorder on like your personal laptop. You could store them in Google Drive. You could store them in your library CMS. Um, you could throw them into commercial cloud storage, although I wouldn't recommend that you do that, <laughs> but um, you, you could do it if you wanted to. Um, so it's a little less user friendly as a lot of open source tools are, but it does allow you to say, create web archives with a Chrome extension. Um, it allows you to kind of replay the web archive files that you create locally or online. Um, Something that's really cool about it is that it also lets you share your web archives through Google Drive. Um, and you know, the, the, the files that are created when, when a web page is archived, um, it is important to mention that they do require replay. Like you don't just double click on them and they open in your browser. You need kind of a program to be able to, to interpret that and replay it and kind of reproduce that that website experience. Um, Web Recorder will let you throw those files into Google Drive, um, give the Web Recorder website uh, permissions to access your Google Drive, just like, you know, <clears throat> like other Google Drive uh, integrations. And it'll pull those files and replay the web archive right there online for anyone to see, for anyone you send the link to. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate it, but it, it's pretty neat and it's very easy to get up and running. Um, like I said, uh, I'll just reiterate that here since it's on the slide, uh, the archiving is user directed. So when you have that Chrome extension installed, you just hit the big red record button um, and then start browsing the site and the crawler will save everything that you click on. Um, most importantly, it's, uh, it's free. Um, so why did we start um, archiving the web at DCPL? Um, 
I mean, I guess the in short, our extensive vertical file collection, like I'm talking physical vertical files that kind of hold an astonishing amount of information about uh, DC, about the city was really, really out of date. Um, it was only being sporadically maintained. Um, and on top of that, DC is, as I'm sure a lot of your homes are, um, is like a very rapidly evolving, developing, uh, gentrifying city. Um, and cutting and pasting the old newspaper clipping into a folder is, was never going to match that, that pace of change. So while vertical files are often information rich, um, yeah, I guess this is like my, my final important point about, about why web archiving specifically is very important. Um, vertical files kind of pull from, from newspaper and magazines, um, which are, you know, those sources are useful, but they rarely document that kind of community perspective is often just straight up missing from the historical record. Um, and as you folks um, work on your, your memory labs and your memory lab programs, I'm sure that point uh, resonates with you. Um, and I'm sure it'll resonate with your, your users too. So in 2017, um, DCPL got involved with what is called the Community Labs Program. Um, so Community Webs is a program of Archivich and the Internet Archive launched in 2017 to advance the capacity for public libraries to build archives of web published primary sources documenting local history and underrepresented voices by providing resources for cohort development, professional training, technology support, um, and scholarly use of web archives. Um, we were part of the initial cohort in 2017 um, but since then, the project has grown to over 150 institutions, and we've gathered over 50 terabytes of data, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, so yeah, in short, it just kind of is creating an infrastructure for public libraries to build web archive collections without really having to worry about how much it costs or how much data they're using um, or any of that. Um, so that's how we kind of got got started in this in this area by applying and by being accepted. So let, let's kind of talk about some of the some of our procedures and like how we select what we save. Um, so we have so what's the CPL selection policy? Basically, is what this slide is is talking about. Um, it is pretty loose, but it's also weirdly specific at the same time. And I'm actually going to click this link and show you some of it. Um, let's see, can I zoom in here? So our selection criteria that are highlighted in beautiful neon yellow here. Um, um, what do I wanna highlight here? So, I mean, the, the key sentence for me is this last one here. Note that this language is purposefully open to allow for reactive collecting as current events are unpredictable and the web in general is at risk and ephemeral. Um, we want to be able to be, we don't want to be restricted by our, our own policies um, with regards to what we collect. Um, and another important point is we want to kind of protect ourselves in terms of what we either are unable to collect uh, tech, like, because of technology, basically. So, I mean, a, a lot of this, uh, a lot of these um, points are just taken wholesale from our, our digital materials collection development policy. But the other one, aside from this sort of reactive collecting point that is specific to web archiving, is this notion of archivability. Um, so I'll read that as well. So archivability, or the extent to which current capture methods can currently harvest the page. Um, we basically don't want to get into trouble <laughs> when you know something happens that we absolutely should be collecting, but the technology isn't quite up to snuff to allow us allow us to collect it properly. Um, so yeah, that's our collection development policy. Um, you'll be able to look at that, I presume, when Siobhan shares the slides after, after we finish uh, talking here. Um, so we have our collection development policy. Um, we also kind of let the public suggest content for us to crawl. So we have a couple of Google Forms 
that lab members of the public or site owners suggest content for us to save. Site owners can also give us permission to crawl their page with that form, which is very important. Um, and finally, as like the sole person that's working, the, for a long time was working on this, um, in terms of finding material, I've often just kind of spent a lot of time brainstorming and poking around the dark corners of the internet for ideas from like Twitter, Reddit, Discord, some, some message boards, and, uh, and some other web archivists. Um, I actually got the idea to crawl uh, the websites of funeral homes, which is where most obituaries live these days instead of in newspapers. Um, I got that idea from a fellow web archivist who was doing that. Uh, I don't remember why they worked, but thank you to them. I don't remember their name either, but thank you very much. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, I kind of got started on this <clears throat> all on my own. Um, and this might be familiar to you because um, we're all kind of stretched very thin. Um, so yeah, while it was great to kind of have complete control over the program, it wasn't really a sustainable way of doing things. Um, so yeah, one full-time employee responsible for policy, outreach, selection, crawling, quality assurance, description and access, as well as everything else that we have to do. That's like, that isn't great. Um, and like I said, I'm sure that's a familiar scenario to all of you. Um, I, I hope with your, at least with your, your memory lab uh, work, you're able to kind of have at least one other person to work on it with you because it's uh, it's a lot to throw onto a single person's shoulders. Um, so yeah, I got started alone and decided to try and scale up a little bit and build a team. So yeah, three years of doing it myself, I just, something had to give. Um, to grow the web archiving program, we decided to develop um, some internal training materials to build a new team. Um, and like a, an, an ancillary benefit of that is, um, you know, as I'm sure you all know, we all have our own unique perspectives and our own unique backgrounds. And I think that's like key to good comprehensive web archiving or even just like good comprehensive historical collections. Um, I am honestly ashamed that it took us this long to bring on more people that aren't me. Um, but it wasn't due to a lack of trying. Um, it basically took the, the pandemic to force our administration to consider uh, new ways of working and like useful work that could be done from home. So what we have now is uh, an internal curriculum to kind of teach about, you know, web archiving ethics, web archiving uh, practices, um, things like that. And with uh, monthly assignments for the five people that are on this team to, you know, basically go out there and crawl content from communities that they are either embedded in or have like, you know, good relationships with uh, the, they built either through their personal lives or through the, the, the work that they do for the library. Um, so having five people do that is a lot easier than having one person do it. So highly recommended. Um, and this affected the kind of materials that we've been crawling. So uh, I guess the, the point of this slide is to demonstrate how we're kind of slowly morphing from like very, very broad topics like neighborhood blogs and city elections and like comics or whatever to specific communities and specific populations and how they represent themselves on the web. Um, so, I mean, a couple of examples that have popped up uh, through, through the work that we, we've been doing as a team are web pages uh, for Asian American communities in DC and then Black LGBTQ communities in Washington, DC. Um, and like I said, this has really only been possible because members, members of our team are either part of those communities or already have like some kind of connection with them. So, I mean, we're, we're trying our utmost not to just kind of storm into places we don't belong and like take all their stuff and get, get a pat on the back for it. Like that, that's really not what we're trying to do. Um, but that said, um, we can always do better. So we are, you know, always looking to try and grow the people that are doing this work within the library and kind of keep, you know, keep trying to 
build relationships with with community on the outside, which is not easy. Um, so at DCPL, we also think it's important to integrate our web archives into our other discovery systems instead of having them siloed off and living only on, like only in the Wayback Machine. Um, not everyone is going to know what a web archive even is. So having these materials be findable is, I think, in itself a kind of outreach. And I also think it's sort of a, a mark of, uh, you know, when you take the time to describe something properly and uh, create like high quality metadata for it and include it in your like archival finding aids and stuff like that. Um, it's sort of a mark of respect, right? It shows that you, you take it seriously. So we we want people to like we don't want to just build relationships on the outside and then they like never really see the results of how it's becoming usable so yeah we we want to demonstrate that we that we care um so we wrote some code that sucks metadata out of the internet archive about our web archive collections and feeds it into archive space so this is like a, an early version of one of our finding aids for, for a web archive collection. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, not all of our collections have these, but we're working on it. Um, but really our, our dream here <clears throat> is that a site creator would sort of see how seriously we, stay, we take stewardship of web archive materials and like see it presented in this way and be able to click through and, you know, view the content um, in various different places. Um, we, we want people to see this and then get excited and then approach us with their own cool web, like web archiving project ideas. Um, the kind of stuff that we would never really come up with on our own um, because we can only know what we already know. And, you know, yeah, no one is an island unto themselves basically. So we want people to see this, get excited, tell us and then try and, you know, work with us. So are there standards in place for web archives metadata? And I know this is going to get everyone very, very excited. So I'll try and be quick about this. So in a word, yeah, there are uh, web archive metadata um, application profiles. Um, OCLC published descriptive metadata for web archives in 2017. Uh, which is what we base most of our own internal profile on, aside from the little deviations that you see on this slide. Um, University of Virginia also published their own metadata profile in 2018. Um, and if you're getting started with web archiving at your institution, these are kind of great places to start. So you don't really have to like reinvent the wheel when you're figuring out like, how do I describe this stuff in my discovery system? Um, so yeah, the, the devi deviations that I mentioned are instead of like, I think a lot of people describe their web archive collections because they're so big at uh, collection level. But up to this point, we've kind of tried to describe them at seed level. Uh, seed is just, you know, web archive language for website. So that means at least, you know, every website in a specific collection will have at least some metadata, uh, whether it's a description that someone's written after looking over it or just some subject headings. We always want to try and, you know, you know, give it at least something. Um, we also have a controlled vocabulary for uh, neighborhoods in DC. There's like over 127 of them. And we, we found it's useful for people to well, or at least it's fun for people to be able to go into our, our archival discovery system and like browse resources by neighborhood. And like you might end up looking at an archival collection from a certain neighborhood and then clicking over to a photograph that's in our, our digital collections. And then you might be able to read a blog about the same, the same area. So we think that that is useful too. Um, we also give all of our web archives unique identifiers. Um, and we use Dublin Core and DAX, all those fun things. Um, or we at least try to get as close as we can to using DAX properly. But, you know, it doesn't fit perfectly. And this is just an example of the kind of goofy stuff you can find and put in your metadata if you're way into web archives. Like, 
how many of you have a creator field where it says Nine Inch Nails Fan 89? Like, that's pretty funny, I think. And I sh I'm sure if you were all unmuted, I could hear, uh, I could hear tons of laughter. Um, so one other thing that we, we really like to do is to encourage use of our materials. Um, and for web archives, that's kind of a challenge, right? Because, you know, they're not particularly widely known. Um, and when you think of a saved web page, I mean, you might just be imagining you can use it just in the way you would use any other web page. Like it's purely informational and it's purely surface, right? Um, but there are non-traditional ways too. And I want to demonstrate one of those um, here today. So I'm going to click on this and I'm going to get back to it in a second. So <clears throat> DC Library also got involved a little bit with what is called the Archives Unleashed project. So let me talk a little bit about what that is. Um, so again, this is just going to be some, some language that they've written. So, you know, grain of salt, everyone gets to self-promote. Um, so the Archives Unleashed project aims to make petabytes of historical internet content accessible to scholars and other groups interested in researching the recent past. Um, so yeah, their name is a little goofy, that's my side, but they, they really do aim to unleash the potential of web archives beyond just presenting researchers with a saved set of pages and calling it a day. Um, They've developed web archive search and data analysis tools to enable scholars, librarians, and archivists to access, share, and investigate recent history since the early days of the World Wide Web through a data science lens. Um, so yeah, it grew out of a series of data thons in you know the wilds of Canada in 2010 or the 2010s, um, eventually growing into a, a Mellon Foundation grant funded project that recently ended. Uh, and yeah, the, their deal is that they're really just creating uh, free web archive uh, search and data analysis tools. Uh, so what can you do with those tools? Well, you can create cool graphs like this. You can, so this is a, a pretty good example of the kind of things you can do. This is a network graph of all the links in a web archive collection. Um, I don't have an interactive version of it right here, but what, what it is basically showing is how these websites cluster, how they diverge, um, and how they intersect. Um, I mean, in essence, it's showing you how these thousands of websites connect to one another and like the sort of color-coded communities that emerge. Um, and I think that is wild. Let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna click on a live version of this actually, because I think I clicked it. So this is an example from a datathon that was organized by Archives Unleashed and George Washington University uh, that used DCPL's collections in 2019. Uh, what you see here is a collection of all of the images from a web archive, from a music web archive. And they're all like clumped together in this cool array where you can click and zoom in and see metadata about each and every one of them. Zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, scroll. Um, yeah. And some of this is crazy stuff. You want, you want a, a ticket to see Fleetwood Mac in 2013? You, you got it. Um, I lost my notes, hold on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, the whole point of this is that it was kind of great to see. Um, so this was a volunteer event, and it was great to see volunteers approach our collections as data in ways that we, we'd always kind of dreamed of, but never really had the time to work on ourselves. Um, so I mean, if you have any web archive materials at your institutions, I would really encourage you to check out the Archives Unleashed tool set, which is what enabled all this to happen. Um, we're actually kind of looking at implementing some of their tools um, in our, our reading rooms at our central library when we eventually reopen to kind of expand this like very academic research oriented approach like beyond uh, 
universities that you have to pay thousands of dollars to get access to tools like this. Um, we love the idea of someone coming in and you know being able to use material that they they didn't expect and being able to like get a new perspective on the kind of research that is that is possible now. Um, we really just want people to see collections in a, in a new way, um, and that's kind of you know what I hope web archiving brings to the to the world really. Um, so finally, and maybe most importantly, um, yeah, I, I think um, the best outreach method is is like per, per participation, right? Um, and I think we've had quite a lot of success with that at DC Library. Um, so I, I mentioned previously that we have public suggestion boxes set up for people to submit content for inclusion in our web archive collections. Um, what I didn't say in that slide is that no one ever uses them. Um, like no one ever uses them. It was like quite crushingly disappointing for me. Um, but the project that I have highlighted on this slide that both Siobhan and I worked on along with some other people called um, Archive This Moment uh, went very differently. Um, so this was a project to document how COVID impacted life in DC. Um, and we, the, the difference I think in terms of engaging the public was in meeting people where they already were out there in social media. Um, so I'm not going to spend like a ton of time talking about this because there's, there's a link to an article about it um, on the slide there. Um, but I mean, the, the difference between just waiting there and like waiting for people to come to us uh, versus this approach. I mean, the difference was in the thousands, with, you know, in terms of people that engaged with it in some way. Um, and although we didn't use Archivit or Web Recorder or any of the, the web archiving uh, tools that I've already talked about during this webinar, um, it was still very much, a, in my mind, a web archiving project and very inspired by web archiving concepts. Um, so, I mean, I, maybe there are lessons here too for, for Memory Lab, right? Um, you know, if you're having trouble reaching people and like making known the sort of collections, that, not collections, but services that you have. Um, I know it's very easy to say meet people where they are um, and it's easier said than done, but I, that is something that worked for us and I really wanna try and integrate it into other initiatives we have in, in the future. Um, and I'm really open to hearing your ideas about how to, how to do that. Um, so, what is next for us at DCPL for web archiving? Um, so in that regard, um, we want to start having community data thons um, and community describe a thons. Um, so the first one may be reaching out to like computer science departments at local universities to invite students to come in and play with web archive data or students in high school or even in community college. Like we we're still figuring it out, but we we wanna like bring people in and you know get them excited about this stuff um we also want to help people you know have help people have people help us create metadata basically that's what the scribathons are all about um and finally i it really is a hope of mine to integrate and work with the shivan in some capacity to kind of bring some of these web archiving tools to the memory lab model. But I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself in talking about that, but um, it's, it's just something that's been on my mind for a long time. And I think the public could really benefit from using these tools. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much for your time. Um, sorry if I talked too long, but um, I'm here for, for questions and comments and conversation or whatever it is you want to do. So um, I'll sign out and stop talking. Thanks so much. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, we had a few questions um, while we were going along. Um, Heather asked about, um, this is near the beginning, if, if a website no longer exists and it's been archived, do all the clicking, uh, like all the clicking out to links work? Um, yeah, they usually do. Um, 
where you can run into problems is if the website links to another website. Um, but, but there are ways around that. Like if it's being crawled in a certain way, maybe those links were sucked in and captured, but generally speaking, it sort of treats a web archive or a website as like a, a unit onto itself. So mm -hmm. if you have like a blog that links out to Twitter, like the Twitter link probably isn't gonna work. Right, okay. Yeah, but if you have video that, or that you, I'm trying to think of other, like video that you uploaded potentially, would that get? It will, yeah. So like any, any content that's embedded in the site and that you can view natively on the page, you don't have to click and go somewhere else to see, can be included. Okay, great. Um, Jonathan has a fun fact that the original Space Jam website from 1996 is still live and has not been updated. It sure is. <laughs> um, So Jonathan said, web recorder would have been nice to know about when they transitioned to a new website a few years ago and they had to abandon their old one. The index for their photos on the old site was really helpful though. So that's an interesting way to. I'd recommend you throw that link into the Wayback Machine and see if it's there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it might It might be. Um, it also might not be, so don't get your hopes up too much, but it might be. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, uh, I mean, all the index is based off of the metadata we do have, but I mean, um, it, it was nice because the public, they would just enter a search term and even photos, we have metadata for photos that were not scanned and people were able to request those. And now we've moved on to a new platform where um, our digital photos are on internet archive and California revealed, but our, we don't, we excluded the metadata for photos that were not scanned. So there's a whole thing that we're still working on, but having that access to that old index would have been helpful. That sucks. I'm sorry to hear that, John. <laughs> it's a tale of woe and I won't get into it, but you know, I, if I would have known about web recorder, I would have just done that. Well, I mean, that actually brings up a, a pretty important point actually. Um, so one type of content that web archive software has generally a lot of problems with is database type content. You know, like content where you have to go to a website and type something in and have it search for it because it is only replicating, you know, what the web crawler can find. And oftentimes the, like the structured database content is not accessible in the same way. Um, it can help if you have like access, you know, if you, I don't know, there are ways of getting around that sometimes, but generally if you have to like type in a search term and there's no other way like, or no other site map to get to all that individual like record content, kind of, you might have to forget it, which is rough, but you know, nothing works perfectly. Very true. Heather asked a question about proprietary websites that they had a website built 15 years ago, moved to WordPress two years ago um, because that old one was proprietary and they couldn't do anything, couldn't use anything. But it, yeah, it would have been great to have had an archived version. It's true. Yeah, um, I mean, one thing that a lot of people do is, you know, like in the example you, you pointed out, Heather, is, um, when institutions, like oftentimes it's the only website that institutions archive is their own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going out there and doing community archiving, but um, that isn't what, I mean, that isn't as widely, that's not the, the most widely used model, I don't think. I think it's more about like record keeping on an institutional level, um, but it is great for that and very useful for that too. Um, Again, I would recommend you go check, like the website might be in the Wayback Machine already. I did, I did, and it's there. That's so the website I'm referring to is the Encyclopedia of Arkansas, um, and we have over 6,000 entries now. So the old version is there. I'm not sure I'm gonna tell the staff there because they really liked their old version, but, um, but 
I, it's, it's there. Oh my gosh. It's, I went in the way back machine. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exciting though. I love, I love every now and again, I'll think of something like, I'm like, Oh, I want to see if that's in there. And mm -hmm. then when it is, it's just like such a, it's like, wow, amazing. Something from like 1999 or even before, um, like, but, but that is actually one thing that interestingly enough, I recently did, I sent this to you, Paul, but, um, I was looking up, a an old website from 1999 that had a lot of, uh, video that was embedded in it. Well, and not embedded, it, it was, it was uploaded to that site, but that video did not, was not captured in the, um, way back mach machine, but that's because that was like the original way that they captured things, right? They weren't mm -hmm. able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I was um, I was 13 in 1996 when they started doing it. So I don't know how they started doing it, but um, I, I think that's a reasonable assumption um, that the technology just wasn't as advanced back when they started doing this and they can now do more, but it doesn't mean you can like backfill stuff that's already done, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. But that's another thing to think about when you are looking for things that are maybe at, at least the website's there, but um, it might have been captured early and might not have all aspects of it um, there. But do you have any tips, Paul, on, on how to like engage the public more about this? Um, just sort of like outreach. I, I guess the main thing is like how, how to get people to care. I think that example you gave of like accountability, government accountability is great. Um, any other thoughts? Um, I've not, I've truthfully not been very successful at it. Um, um, like I said, the, the, the way that the archive this moment stuff initially like really engaged people, there might be lessons to, to be learned there. Um, I mean, I know that it's not particularly helpful to kind of wait for public tragedy to drive people to, to want stuff to be archived or saved, but oftentimes it's like, it takes big events to get people to care. Um, and I think you, some, you might just have to be ready to, um, I mean, I hate the idea of like harnessing tragedy for institutional gain. But it doesn't have to like be about that. It, you know, you can maybe learn some lessons in like, you know, I, I don't know. I don't really have an answer. But yeah, it's a, it's it's a sort of one of the things that keeps we keep learning, and it depends on the audience and uh, how you approach it. With each person is different. Yeah, and it's like no no one in the pub like no one on the outside cares about archives until like one catches fire and everything's gone right. Like a ton of money's raised, and everybody forgets about it. Yeah. Well, that that happened to us about a year ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a, a library, you know, twenty five miles from us actually burned down and lost everything, and the whole community is like, "Oh, the photos are gone," and all this stuff, and and uh, so it's I I totally get it because people they I just want to jump in because the library catching fire did happen to us. Yeah. Absolutely. And it does. Yeah, like that. I, I, it's like, yeah, not to use a tragedy to, for our, our ends or our means or whatever, but um, like, yeah, it is at least something that, that um, hopefully now people appreciate the other, the things that survived more, Jonathan? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. And I've been working with that library to help them jumpstart their rare book collection, but um <laughs> But more than anything, it's like when when we get our memory lab up and running, we're going to try to stress to people, you know, these, you know, um, you know, uh, all all your photos and everything else. That's part of our cultural record. We need to hold on to that. And because we have experienced this tragedy, you know, and uh, and it's not just us, but there are other locations that have floods and tornadoes and everything else. And uh, it, it's I mean, it, it's a shame that people have to wait until a tragedy for them to realize that, 
you know so i think the challenge is really trying to get people to understand this should be part of your family history and which is part of our cultural record and we should appreciate it now Mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely and uh, yeah it's so interesting because i mean you're talking about photos and having a hard time getting people to grasp the importance of that and then it's like to me it would be even harder to try and explain and get people on board about archiving websites you know like because it's so it's so new i mean even like video and film i think sometimes people are just like eh but that's so new like let's let's uh focus on this mm-hmm. very fancy old piece of paper over here you know um rather than the things that are so new but are actually very at risk um yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's why we're kind of trying to think around like what what kind of programming can we have to like that can somehow use this stuff. Um, so yeah, I mentioned things like data thons and stuff like that. I, I think that's a great way, especially if it's with like younger people, like people that are in high school, people that are like in college, um, like we were not not too long ago. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's you, you're just planting seeds with you know, by doing that kind of thing. And that, that's, that's our hope that, you know, we, we realize that this is like a pretty niche thing, even in like library and archives land. And we, we have realistic expectations. We're not expecting to like, you know, start a web archiving revolution. But if we can get some people interested, like maybe they'll tell other people. And, you know, if someone sees a web archive in our, like in archive space, and it's like, hey, what's that? Like, it's all about like the the drip feed of like, you know, people slowly learning about something instead of just like expecting them to be interested in it. Like, cause like, why would they be, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's a good point that it could be used, especially in public library and uh, that this could be used to teach other types of like digital literacy skills yeah. and like that. So that's. Yeah, so I mean that that example earlier, like in the slides of like the the government website that changed after Jared Kushner like said a thing, like that that's like digital like that's information literacy one hundred and one, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Right. Yeah, but I mean, also you can all try to point to uh, some of the recent kind of online examples where you know there's been you can't access the digital like the web information like the the big old you know myspace tragedy where they didn't (laughs) they didn't you know back up their information and they lost like you know what years of data you know and you can tell people that these are you know because we don't have that there's a huge gap and that's why web archiving is important you know, or or even vines, which you know that's more recent, where they shut that down, and some of those vines live on, but there's a whole bunch of them that you know you can't access anymore. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's so many. It's like MySpace you could throw out there, and then like uh, even there's other ones. I feel like yeah, it's absolutely like coming up and and. Uh, being like, hey, did you have this? Did you have a MySpace account? Did you have a live journal? Did you have this or that? Um, and kind of con- making that personal cl- connection, just like regularly we try and do that, where we're just like, hey, have you ever had a hard drive become corrupted? Like, that's why you need multiple, or a file become, that's why you need multiple copies. So yeah, just like, once again, it is sort of the disaster <laughs> mentality, but, you're right, Jonathan. Y- Yahoo Answers is, is the latest thing. Oh, Yahoo yeah. yeah. But we got Space Jam still, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All that matters. Um, well, this was a pretty robust conversation for there only being like five people that dialed in. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> That's what the thing. Group. It's power, our power uh, users. Yeah. yeah. What a cool group. I, yeah. I, should, I should be more involved with you folks. This, this, this was fun. You're always welcome to join us, Paul, uh, for our webinars. Actually, next month I am doing, uh, I'm going to be doing it myself on the cloud. The so cloud. Think, the cloud. <laughs> uh, I think I might actually be asking you some questions to prepare myself for that. So. I mean, you probably know more than I do, but ha- happy to help. Cool. 
Yes. Yeah. Are you invited to the Slack call? Do you need the, I'll invite you to the Memory Lab Network Slack. Yeah, please do. I, I've come to a couple of the webinars, like the one on transcription was really awesome. And I actually like stole so many of the ideas from that. Fantastic. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's Helpful stuff. Want. Great community of, of uh, folks that are doing cool things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a lot of information. I just wish I had all the time in the world to implement everything, but I've, I've learned a lot. And uh, I know when my partner is here, Amy, uh, I'll definitely pass on this information with the uh, Archives Unleashed uh, tool toolkit because um, just because you know we're part of a museum alliance, and I think some of our partners could use that. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, exactly, Jonathan. It's totally like a lot of this, a lot of our webinars and stuff. It, I know it does sort of highlight things like, hey, you could do this, you could do that. Um, and yeah, you don't ha have to do everything. Nobody can do everything. So yeah, it's great to, once again, just like funnel the information to others, maybe, for them to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. I mean, that's good to hear. And yeah, I will be sharing the recording of this and then also the slides for the links that, that um, Paul mentioned. And yeah, thank you so much, Paul, for your presentation and for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Cool. And thanks, Jonathan, for coming um, and asking such great questions and being overall rad. <laughs> No, I, I really enjoy these and uh, and I, I learn something new every every time. That's great. That makes me very happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, take care, both of you, and talk soon. Bye, everybody. Thanks. All again. right. Bye bye. bye.